Good morning. If you have your Bibles with you, I'm going to invite you to turn first to the book of Ephesians. I just want to touch base on a verse that's there, Ephesians chapter 2, and then we will move back into the book of Acts. We uh, obviously want to welcome little Kaylin here this morning. We have been waiting to see the little lumberjack. And <laughs> why, can you just stand up, Elena? We want to welcome this little one into our family. Oh, just beautiful. Just beautiful. Thank you. Great to have you folks with us again. So, <clears throat> last week in our study through the book of Acts, I mentioned to you that the, the way that the original church, the original church of Scripture, expanded with power, and the way that the church there, the first church in Acts, moved out of Jerusalem, and then into Judea, and then into Samaria, and then throughout the ancient world, and even to us here this morning, the, the way that that happened, according to the book of Acts, is through what we call personal conversions. Uh, those are spiritual transformations, personal encounters with the living God. A, a true conversion that brings you from spiritual death to spiritual life, according to the Bible, is when a person recognizes their sin and the separation that that sin has caused between us and God, and then this person recognizes that the way to God is through faith, through trusting in the gospel message of Scripture that Jesus is our Savior, that Jesus has paid our price for sin. The spiritual conversion moves us from us trying to run or drive our life to now allowing Jesus to run our life. And that happens, as we've spoken of, that happens as we surrender ourselves moment by moment, day by day, to God and to his spirit working in us. The scripture that I think depicts or best depicts or best expresses what this gospel message is all about is really found here in Ephesians chapter 2, and it, it's a familiar couple of verses. Uh, there at the beginning of verse 8, you'll see that it says this. It says, again, we're talking about the gospel and what conversion, personal conversion, looks like. It says, therefore, by grace. Now, grace is God's unconditional kindness. Unconditional is the key word there. For by grace you have been saved. That is, you have been rescued from what? From sin and from death. Through or by the means of faith. And faith is when I personally trust in the redeeming, resurrecting Jesus who is the Son of God and Master over all things. So the verse says, for by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not of your own doing. So this is a rescue from sin that is not achievable on or behalf of anything that we can do. And then it says, it is the gift of God. The gift of God. So a gift can only be accepted, right? Right? It can't be paid for in any way because if it's paid for, then it's not a gift. So we must receive this, 
accept this just as it is a gift. And then it says, not a result of work, so we can't achieve our rescue from sin. Why? So that no one may boast. You see, conversion starts and it ends with a heart of humility. And a heart of humility says, Jesus, you're, you're the only one that can rescue me from my sinful state. I, I can't work for it. I can't achieve it. I, 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 I can't latch on to somebody else's faith. I must humble myself and put my trust in you. Now, the truth in that verse, my trusting in that truth for rescue from sin is really the core of conversion. It's the core of what we're witnessing here in the book of Acts. When people put their faith, their trust in Jesus and what he's done and not trying to put faith in themselves. So if you could turn back now to the book of Acts, Acts chapter 9, that's where we kind of find ourselves on this travel, this journey through this book. And this morning we come to one of the most encouraging recorded conversions in all of Scripture. And I say that because most of us will be able to identify with at least one or more parts of this man's, uh, this man's Saul's life story. And so you might remember that we were introduced to this man named Saul back at the end of chapter 7 and a little bit in chapter 8. There in chapter 7, it says that when they cast uh, Stephen, the, the Christ follower, the, the first, one of the first deacons of the church, when they cast him out of the city, they stoned him. And it says there in that verse, and the witnesses laid down their garments at the feet of a young man named Saul. And so that was our first introduction to this man named Saul. And then in chapter 8, verse 3, it says, but Saul was ravaging the church and entering house after house. He dragged off men and women and committed them to prison. Now here in chapter 9, beginning at verse 1, we run into this man whose name is Saul once again. And it, and it says here that Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord. And so I think you've got a kind of a pretty good picture of what this Saul is all about. You'll remember that Saul was a Pharisee, and Pharisees were Jewish men and women who held to the belief, who held to the tradition that the way to a relationship with God was essentially through striving to obey or to keep all the do's and all the don'ts of the Old Testament Scripture. Now, that's important for us to know because what we have to recognize is that the Pharisees were highly offended by the message of the Christians because the Christians taught that salvation comes through grace, through God's kindness. And salvation comes to my life as I put my trust on Jesus and what he's done for me. And you see, the simplicity of the gospel message went against the very fiber of the Pharisees. Because the Pharisees are works oriented, and the Christians who lived according to the teachings of Jesus were faith oriented. Big difference. So it says here in verse 1 that Saul, still breathing, threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord went to the high priest and Saul asked him for letters to the synagogues at Damascus so that if he found any 
belonging to the way, that's the way of salvation, men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. So Saul is on a mission. And apparently there are Jesus followers now, Christians who have made their way into the synagogues of Damascus. Damascus is about 150 miles north of Jerusalem. And so Saul is very passionate with the mission that he's on here. And it says there in verse 3, Now as he went on his way, he approached Damascus, and suddenly a light from heaven shone around him. And falling to the ground, he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, Who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But rise and enter the city, and you will be told what you are to do. The men who were traveling there with Saul stood speechless. Hearing the voice, but seeing no one. Saul, he rose from the ground, and although his eyes were opened, he saw nothing. And so they led him by the hand, and they brought him into Damascus. And for three days he was without sight, and he neither ate nor he drank, nor drank. Now there was a disciple at Damascus whose name was Ananias. And the Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias, and he said, Here I am, Lord. And the Lord said to him, Rise up and go to the street called Straight. And at the house of Judas, look for a man of Tarsus named Saul. For behold, he is praying. And he has seen in a vision a a man named Ananias come in and lay his hands on him so that he might regain his sight. But Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from many about this man, how much evil he has done to your saints down in Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priest to bind all who call on your name. But the Lord said to him, Go, for he is a chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel, for I will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. So Ananias departed and entered the house, and laying his hands on him, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road by which you came has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately something like scales fell from his eyes, and he regained his sight, and then Saul rose up and was baptized, and taking food, he was strengthened. Well, here's kind of the bullseye thought for us this morning. Saul's conversion, this conversion that you and I have right before us in the Scripture, this conversion was recorded for us personally. And I say that because years after this incident, Saul went on to write a book in Scripture called 1 Timothy. And Saul, speaking about himself, after he has become a follower of Jesus, he says this about himself. He says, listen, I am the foremost of sinners, but I received mercy for this reason, that in me, as the foremost sinner, Jesus Christ might display his perfect Patience, now listen, for an example to those who were to believe in him, in Jesus, for eternal life. 
You see, God, who is great in mercy and great in patience, had you and had me in mind when he came on this day and rescued Saul from his sin and delivered him into the kingdom of righteousness. So this morning, I just want to take a few minutes and look here at chapter 9, and I want us to look at this particular conversion from this angle, that this is written for us. How might this conversion encourage us today as we too journey through this life? Well, the first thing I want us to see is that your bad, your bad is never too bad for Jesus. Your bad is never too bad for Jesus. It says there in verse 1 that Saul was continuing to breathe threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord. You see, for Saul, he believed with his whole heart that what he was doing, all of this persecuting, all of this um, harassment, all of this tormenting of all of these Christians, his torment against all of these people who were proclaiming the gospel message, Saul believed in his heart that this passion to extinguish the gospel would actually please God. And so Saul's Saul's motives were spiritual in nature, but his motives weren't founded on all of God's truth. In fact, much of Saul's passion came from long past traditions that had been thought up and put down on a scroll somewhere from other religious Jewish men. And so Saul is thinking in this adrenaline of passion, he's thinking being right with God certainly can't happen by simply believing the gospel message. It's just way too simple. It must come by following the rules and the laws and the traditions of the Old Testament scriptures. See, Saul was not truth-driven, but rather tradition-driven. And that led him into a life of passionate disobedience. Do you ever get into a thought pattern in your own head where you think that you have to be really good? You have to be on a roll of being good and doing good for X amount of hours or days to really be accepted and loved by God. Your bad far outweighs your good. And you know that in your heart. And so you go to work each day through different seasons of your life striving to be and striving to do what you think might just make God happy enough to recognize you. I think we all struggle with that from time to time. I think it's just part of our human nature. We believe that doing good and being good will get you to Accept me. And it's this kind of misaligned spiritual energy that drives Saul's life. And as a Pharisee, he did everything he could do to go after this teaching, this gospel message that God saved people by faith, and trust in Christ and not by rule-keeping. 
See, that's important to consider because this Saul, this is the kind of person that we would never expect God to have any interest in. Uh, Saul's beliefs are just way too out there. His life is obviously way too rooted in evil. Certainly there's too much wickedness in his past to ever be rescued. Well, the point before us is this, that your bad is never too bad for Jesus. And he proves that by giving us this first-hand account of Saul finding forgiveness because of the grace of God. And so I want you to understand that God's rescuing power is not limited to people who have been set up by Christianity or been raised in a good family or has, have had some kind of church association or some clean moral track record this very evil man, Saul, he was converted. The scripture tells us that his broken heart became a whole heart because no bad is too bad for Jesus. The second thing that I think we can see here is that you can't put God in a box that always comfortably aligns with human reason. You can't put God in a box that always comfortably aligns with human reason. You know, in our Western world, we, we love to squeeze God into this nice, neatly wrapped, logical, understandable box where Reason, human reason, is always the key that unlocks our theology. It says there in verse 3, Now, as he journeyed, he approached Damascus, this is Saul, and suddenly a, a light from heaven flashed about him. So again, Saul is traveling like 150 miles north, to seize any Christians that he can find. His zeal, his passion, his focus, his aggression is, is, is focused on capturing anyone who could or who would ever simplify the teaching of Scripture, anyone who would believe that Jesus offers this gift of salvation by faith alone. And so we see Saul here marching passionately forward and suddenly... This God, who he thinks he knows, and he thinks he understands, all of a sudden this God appears. But he doesn't appear in a way that human reasoning can wrap its brain around. He appears into this, in a light way, into a darkness and, 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 and Paul is struck blind by the light of Jesus, the, the light of, of, of Jesus' grace, walking along in darkness. The Scripture says this light appears. And what strikes me here is the, the personal space, the, the personal place that Saul finds himself as he's on this road, as he's on this religious mission. Understand that at this point in time, Saul doesn't have a guilty conscience. He's not even remorseful for the things that he's done. In other words, he's still on this hunt for Christians. And Saul is full steam ahead. And yet, that doesn't stop God from revealing his true love and kindness 
and compassion that he has for Saul. It, do, it doesn't stop God. Saul is convinced that this gospel of Jesus is being preached, that's now being proclaimed and heralded throughout the, 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 the churches, the synagogues. Saul believes that this is completely untrue. And Saul is just becoming more and more convinced of the falsehood of the gospel. I mean, how many people would walk 150 miles just to find people, believers, who would have to now turn around and walk back 150 miles into Jerusalem so that they could either be jailed, imprisoned, or put to death? He's passionate about what he's doing here. And many of us would begin to think that no doubt Saul is done. He's way too spiritually dry. His heart is way too hard. His soul is way too shriveled up. He's beyond repair. Yet what happened to Saul happens suddenly, it happens unexpectedly, it happens supernaturally, it's unforeseen by the human eye, and yet God transcends the human mind, which means that what he did for Saul there on that road to Damascus, he can do for you this morning, and he can do for me, and he can do for those that maybe you have prayed for year after year after year, because God is not confined by a box of human ingenuity. He's not held captive by our neat and tidy theological ideas. God is supernatural, and his ways are at times far beyond our ways. And he is capable of still reaching the darkest sinner in the darkest place at their darkest times. Why is that? It's because it was people like Saul that Jesus went to the cross and died for. I love the couple of verses that we find in Luke chapter 5. Again, I find this very encouraging for my own life. Jesus is talking here and he says, listen, He says, healthy people don't need a doctor. Sick people do. And then he says, I have come to call not those who think they are righteous, but those who know they are sinners and need to repent, who need to turn their life around, who need to turn their thinking around. The third thing that we see here is that God's transcendent love and his sovereign plan that draws us to himself is not built on our good character or our moral deeds. It's God's transcendent love and it's his sovereign plan that draws us. That's a very hard concept for the human mind to comprehend. The sovereignty of God. Sovereignty is simply defined as supreme power. Supreme authority. And so from a theological standpoint, sovereignty means that God is at the top. There's no one in authority or power above him. He's the creator. He's the ruler, 
He's the one that holds the world together. That's what sovereignty really means. And we see it all over this story. First, you, you see that Jesus totally took over on the Damascus Road here. Jesus isn't responding to anything that Saul has done to win over his grace or his kindness. Everything is fueled by God's sovereignty, which means that it's grace-driven, utterly free, utterly unmerited, and it all comes from a God who holds all authority and power in his hand. Take a look just for a moment at some of the evidences of this sovereignty at work here. First, God causes a light to flash from heaven, and it brings blinding brightness. In fact, we're told there that Paul is blind for three days until Ananias comes and lays hands on him and prays for him. So God blinds Saul, and God takes away Saul's blindness, that sovereignty. Secondly, notice that the voice that speaks to Saul from heaven doesn't ask for Saul's free decision to believe in his son Jesus. In fact, it tells him exactly what to do. In verse 5, it says, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But rise and enter the city and you will be told what you are to do. So again, what that's saying is that even in this conversion situation, even in this salvation scenario, Jesus is completely in charge of the situation. And God is completely arranging all of the pieces together so that Saul will not only recognize the the emptiness and the darkness of his own life, but more so the fullness that can come when Jesus takes control. The third thing we see here, verses 15 and 16 actually make that point really clear. Ananias, this prophet who's in Damascus, he's afraid to go and pray for this Saul. But Jesus says to him in a vision, I want you to go. For he is a chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before the Gentiles and kings and the sons of Israel. And I will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. And so you see, conversion, this work of rescuing us from our sin is a work of sovereign grace, where God comes in and he moves in our lives and he surprises us with unconditional love and he offers to us a peace that maybe we've never known and a joy that will last through hard times. And he gives us a purpose for waking up in the morning and living. The fact is that we don't first find God. God first finds us. And that's a good thing. And again, like I said to you last week, what that says to me is that even if you're here this morning, you're not here by mistake. You're not here hearing the gospel. You're not here sitting under truth. You're not here in this place of worship because you just thought it would be a good thing to do today. It's very possible that God is trying to woo you to himself. Lastly, I want to remind you that all of this, this all of this story, these truths, this reality, again, is for your sake. And I want to remind you that God had you in view when he chose Saul and rescued him. 
by his grace. And 1 Timothy 1 should really be a verse that brings great encouragement and, and joy to your heart this morning, wherever you might be on this life journey. Because this very evil man, even evil in the sense of doing spiritually or religious good things, but they were wrong. He's able to say, listen, I'm, I'm the foremost of sinners, but I received mercy for this reason, that in me as the foremost Jesus Christ might display his perfect patience for an example to those who were to believe in him for eternal life. The scripture, other scriptures tell us that it's God's patience, it's God's kindness, it's God's unconditional love that draws us to himself. There'll come a day when that patience is over. There'll come a day when we will no longer be able to respond to the wooing of our Savior. And so the scripture says that we're to do business with God as he's working in our lives so that not another minute is wasted in this life. Let's pray. Father, there's so very much in this scripture. We're so grateful, Lord God, that, that you're not bound by theological boxes that we put you in but rather you are a supernatural God that can transcend into the darkest places of our heart and bring light to that darkness. And in that light, we recognize that Jesus, you not only died on the cross, to be our savior, but you died on the cross to, to take over the leadership of our life so that we could live with purpose and meaning in such a way that you would be honored and exalted. Lord, for many of us, we've messed up enough of our life and we need you as our creator, as the God cares for us, the God who loves us, the God who died for us, we need you to come and to do a deeper work inside of our hearts. Would you remind us this morning, Lord, that this world in which we live is just a place that we're passing through, that there is an eternal heaven and there is an eternal hell. And every one of us will enter into one of those two places. And so again, I pray that your spirit will pour upon our hearts this morning and that if we've never put our trust in you and if we've never allowed you just to become the leader, the Lord of our lives, that even today we would make that decision to receive your gift of grace and to lay down all of the works and the deeds that we think are going to make you happy, would you allow us just to lay those down and to first simply be accepted by you because of your great grace and love for us? Lord, help us to remember also that you are a sovereign God. For many of us, we have prayed for 
days, months, even years for others that we know to come to know you. Might we not give up? But God, might we remember that you come in unexpected ways at unexpected times to rescue those you have chosen to be yours. We honor you this morning. We glorify you. We thank you for your truth. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.